Welcome to another episode of the Doctors Podcast with Rabia Akram. This is Rabia Akram. I'm a medical doctor, an entrepreneur, and a brain health expert. And in this podcast, I interview other medical doctors, worldwide leading experts in health and performance enhancement. And I bring you their stories of success and their formula for overcoming personal challenges and success. So today I have Dr. David Steenblock here with me, joining me virtually from the United States. Dr. Steenblock is a medical doctor specialized in osteopathic medicine. He's also working in the forefront of stem cell research and clinical practice using stem cells. So I'm super excited to have this conversation with him today. Dr. Steenblock, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So, you know, I'm, there are various reasons I'm super excited to have this conversation with you today because stem cell is such an exciting area of research and clinically, like, um, it's one of those fields that are definitely going to be, uh, you know, big game changers when it comes to patient care and patient treatment in the next um, decades, I, I, I guess. So you working, having so much experience working with thousands of patients with your throughout your clinical career and also working in the for- forefront of this research, uh, stem cell research. I want to know all the insider information from you, and I'm really excited to, you know, just jump right in. Before I get into all that, I want to, you know, start by asking you, can you tell, tell us a little bit about your background, like how you got into stem cells and, you know, in general, like what you do? Mm. Well, uh reschedule us for about three weeks worth of conversation and then we'll just start to touch on all of this information that you're asking about. Uh, I got into it. I'm an Iowa farm boy. And uh, so I was raised on a farm. I learned how to grow things, etc. And so it was a natural thing as I came along in the 1990s. It was a decade of the brain. And I spent that 10 years doing stroke rehabilitation. So I treated thousands of patients with uh, what was available at that time. Uh, which was hyperbaric oxygen, kind of new. I was the first one in the country, in the world per, pretty much to do that. And so I had people coming from all over the world and I had a very busy place because I was the only one. But then after 10 years, uh, I had been lecturing, et cetera. And so more and more doctors started to buy chambers and, and people started to buy chambers and they became more available. And, and so my, my, my uh, hyperbaric oxygen uh, practice was dwindling, but in, in any case, there were patients that were saying, well, this is good. I've gotten a lot better, but I'd like to get even better. So what else is there? So I started looking for what else there was and stem cells just happened to appear about 2000. And uh, I was able to uh, figure out how to get a hold of a few and tried them out and they seemed to work well. And, and so from there, I just uh, jumped into doing, uh, figuring out what can I do to prove? Because at that time, there was no clinical studies whatsoever on the human use of stem cells. And so uh, I decided that the best type of case was a case of cerebral palsy. Kids, these are children with uh, virtually no other medical problems other than a, some kind of brain injury. And uh, it turns out that the stem cells happened to go uh, and migrate to that area of brain injury. And so it made sense that uh, they would have lots of growth factors. They're young, they're vital. Uh, they only have that one particular injury, and so they should respond. And so we gave them stem cells, and sure enough, they responded quite well. And, and from that, we had successes, and from then we went to on to other things, stroke and whatever. There's all kinds of things you can use stem cells for. Right, right. I love that, you know, <clears throat> that, that transition from treating stroke patients with hyperbaric oxygen chambers, and then you kind of started looking for better ways to treat those patients, and then you bumped into stem cells. And um, can you tell me a little bit about what has changed in stem cell therapy since then, like from the time you started out to how things are done now? Has there been breakthroughs? Are things being done much more efficiently now. What are the changes? No, in fact, there has not been very much progress. Uh, You know, we had, you know, as far as my office, my office is different than most everybody else's because I have my own stem cell lab. Uh, Virtually no other doctors in the country, in this country, have their own stem cell lab because it costs a lot of money. Uh, And as an Iowa farm boy, I was raised by 
my father and mother who said, well, you got to invest in your business if you're going to make any money. <laughs> and so my, my father would buy a, a combine for $80,000 at that time, which was, you know, 40, 50, well, more 60 years ago. And yeah. so when you spent $80,000 60 years ago, that was a lot of money. And so it was like, are you kidding me? And so I kind of got uh, indoctrinated in the fact that you need to spend money to be able to do things and, and help things. And so uh, I got into to doing uh, uh, stem cells by way of uh, having my own stem cell lab because uh, it, it's I've got about close to a million dollars in my stem cell lab. Uh, and that's just basics not really fancy stuff uh so you could spend you could you know uh, to do it right and to do it by according to the fda and all that uh if you're not a licensed physician you have to spend about 20 million dollars to 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 come close to what the fda wants and even then they don't want you to do it because they're in cahoots basically with the pharmaceutical industry and if you haven't figured it out we have no uh, stem cells available by way of the fda approval and we've had, uh, there was one cl clinical trial uh, by Genentech here back in 2012 for spinal cord injury. And they got halfway through the trial and they said, forget it. Uh, the amount of money we're putting into this, we'll never get our money out. And so therefore we don't care whether or not people have got spinal cord injuries or not, because we can't make any money. So they just quit and threw away. It was like, I think they had invested $60 million, something like that, a lot of money in just the clinical trials that they had got to. So they were going to spend another $200 million. And then they didn't know for sure that they're ever going to get it approved and all that. So they quit. And so that was the, the last uh, big FDA kind of trial that I know of that, uh, that people tried. And, and, you know, like I say, it failed because of the cost. So we haven't had much, you know, and then we have to go back to, uh, from 19, from 2000 to about 2010, we had uh, like here in California, we had the California Institute for for Regenerative Medicine, CIRM, and that was uh, paid. That was a three billion dollar investment in embryonic stem cells. And embryonic stem cells are where you take a, a sperm and an egg, put them together in a test tube. And they go together and they become a zygote. And from there, they become a blastomere. And they take the cells out of this little ball of, of cells. And a few of those then can be turned into embryonic stem cells. And, and they thought at that time that, that you could grow these forever and they would be safe. And so we have, would have unlimited supply of these embryonic stem cells. And they're great because they really can get in and fix a lot of things. And so it was great. They thought it was wonderful. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way. So we spent $3 billion at least, and then 10 years of effort. And what we got out of it was a lot of labs uh, and lab equipment, but not much in terms of practical, <laughs> practical use. And so why did that, why did that study not uh, bring in your results? Like the one with uh, everybody had to quit because of the fact that when you put all these cells together in a big vat, they, they, they tend to aggregate and clump together. And when they clump together, they start feeding each other growth factors. And these, all these different growth factors feeding on each other causes the development of cancer. And so every time they would ever try to get these cells into some kind of a situation where they're giving it to people, they wound up with cancer. And so anyway, they did it in animals, of course, first, and they found that you know, they were getting all these animals with, with cancer. So they had to quit. So, so at that point, then at that time, 2007, uh, there was uh, the Yamanaka factors came along and these were, you know, like basically a simple amino acids kind of things that if you mix them with the stem, with, with, um, no, like uh, stem cells, or if you mix them with fibroblasts or any other cell, you could actually convert those cells uh, that are normal into what are called induced pluripotent stem cells. And they acted like embryonic stem cells and they were able to do all kinds of things. However, they still, they were, they were manipulated by these genetic changes. And because of these genetic changes, that kind of stopped everybody from doing it. Because again, now we're manipulating the stem cells genome. And so we don't know what the hell we're getting out of it. So it's, it's now been since, uh, you know, it's been more than 10 years, uh, 15 years now of, of uh, having these induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, they're trying to get them to be used clinically. And there are a few people that are doing them clinically, but they're still pretty much unproven. And so we haven't really advanced as far as that. Now, now saying all that would we'll go back to how I started. And that was with 
with umbilical cord. Umbilical cord blood is a very good type of stem cells, but it doesn't cause cancer. And so, uh, you know, maybe there's out of, out of, I don't know how many hundred thousand cases over the last 30, 40 years, there's been, I think, two cases where they had cancer develop, but it's very slim possibility that you get any kind of problems with, with umbilical cord. So I've been using umbilical cord all this time and I haven't really changed because it's safe and simple and doesn't, uh, you know, it's just easy to do and you get great results in general. Now it's not as maybe as good as embryonic, but I compared, uh, uh, you know, there are some of the people, now there's another type of embryonic and that is where you take the, the mother uh, has gotten herself pregnant and she wants to have an abortion. And so then they, they'll, they do an abortion and they take those cells and out of that, you can get some, what are called embryonic stem cells. And now those are more differentiated than those others that I was talking about. So that these are safer because they, they have already established that they're going to be tissue, this kind of tissue, that kind of tissue. And so you don't have this tendency toward cancer, but uh, it is uh, morally and ethically uh, a fraught because of the fact right. that you're taking human tissues and abort aborting mothers. And, and then there's this th theory or that uh, we're going to pay you uh, to uh, get pregnant and uh, then we abort you and then we use that for, for, for tissue therapy. So uh, we're still in a, in a problematic area of what can be done. Now, now saying all of that, we have, we go back to what we've been doing, we've been doing umbilical cord. And since I have my own lab, it's legal for me to do this. Uh, but if you don't have your own lab, then it's not legal. And so if you, and so if you buy these umbilical cord stem cells from, from some company that sells stem cells and they'd say, oh, we got the umbilical cord stem cells are great, da, 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 da. they're not really correct because they're, they're, um, they're, they're not, they're not uh, cultured. And so they're not pure. And so what they do is they take the umbilical cord, grind it up, and now you've got, yeah, you got some stem cells, but you also have the mother's tissues in there because mother's tissues are in the umbilical cord. And so now you can have graft versus host reactions and allergic reactions yeah. and all that. So all of these people out there that are the doctors that are using this stuff are having to give steroid shots to help prevent the uh, kind of yeah. allergic graft versus host reactions. Right. I, I do have a follow-up question there. So using umbilical cord stem cells um, from, I was going through your book, the book you wrote, um, it's named umbilical cord stem cell therapy. And there I stumbled upon um, the fact, and if I'm, if I'm currently remember, this uh, umbilical cord stem cell therapy is in many countries, including the United States, uh, it's not allowed. Um, and am, am I right? And if I'm correct, then what are the ethical implications? Like what are the problems using umbilical cord stem cell st cells? Well, well, like I said, the, the, the point is that, that the FDA uh, and, and its rules are kind of followed by many countries. And so since they are, they got more money than anybody else and they got more technology than anybody else and they got more brains than anybody else, the rest of the world says, well, if they say this, then that's what we'll do. And so we have this follow, follow the leader kind of mentality throughout the world. So saying that, what does the FDA says? The FDA says that if you take the stem cells, the umbilical cord blood, isolate it, put it into tissue culture and grow it, that's, that's manipulating and that could change those cells into something that's terrible like cancer. Now, they didn't say that too much about the embryonics because there's a lot of money in that. And, and they, those people in the FDA look at money because they know that as soon as they quit the FDA, they can go to work for the pharmaceutical industry and make a huge fortune. So they're always looking ahead. And so uh, in, in general, um, you, uh, the umbilical cord stem cells, if you grow them, uh, they're safe. They're simple uh, and you get great results and there's no cancer. However, that's not what the FDA will tell you because they say, well, there's been no big clinical trials spending, uh, you know, $500 million on proving that it's safe. And, and so we have, uh, we have like, I think one or two uh, umbilical cord blood, uh, FDA approved uh, uh, umbilical cord blood therapies. And those are for cancer patients and their umbilical cord blood. And the blood is not a pure product. It's got all kinds of stuff in it and they can cause all kinds of allergic reactions. And so you have to have in those, you have to have what are called HLA matching. So you have to match all of your 
cord blood that you've got in storage that is FDA approved. You've got to match all of that with all those antigens and find somebody else's, uh, somebody who needs it, a cancer patient. You got to take their HLA, come over here to the lab and say, okay, where in the world do we have blood that matches this poor sucker over here who's got cancer? Well, that's a bitch and a half. Now, and each one of those, now it's not pure at all. But they're selling them because it's an HLA and for cancer. So they, they'll say, oh, for, and because that's kind of like been the routine now for many years that, that when we have bone marrow, we do that. We match with HLA and, and go find somebody else's bone marrow, that kind of thing. In this case, um, uh, it doesn't uh, quite pass muster. Right. On the other hand, we have the option of, um, you know, getting stem cells from bone marrow. And um, when we talk about bone marrow, it can also be like, the own bone marrow, or you can get a donor. So could you please explain to the non-medical viewers, what are the differences and what are the risks? Well, if it's your own bone marrow, it's great because you're not gonna reject anything that you have already in your bone marrow. So what we do, it's a very simple procedure. Uh, you know, we make sure that you don't have any infections and, and your hormones are good and all that kind of stuff. But if you're good to go, otherwise, then uh, it's a simple procedure. Uh, we give you a local anesthetic in the, in the, in the back of the hip and, uh, and we put a, a needle in there. We take out the bone marrow, put it into a bag uh, with a little bit of salt water maybe and drip it back into your vein. It's a very simple procedure. Uh, almost any doctor who's got any kind of surgical skills can do it. Unfortunately, yeah. many doctors don't have one iota of surgical skills. <laughs> <laughs> I, hate right. tell you. I hate to tell you, but you would think that all these doctors who have gone through all these years of training would be able to pick up, pick up a, a, a hemostat and a scalpel or something, do something like tie a knot. No, they never learn how to tie a knot. They have no clue. So you have to isolate, figure out, does, it, does a doctor have any kind of skills whatsoever? Uh, and I had a lot of surgical training and all that. So it's, right. you know, and I, I was a single solo practitioner in a rural logging town where I was just the doctor of, out of 5,000 people. And I had a 32 bed hospital. It was me. And, and I had to do my own anesthesia and I had to do my own operations, etc. So you, you learn how to do things. And, you learn and, how to do things. But in, in most doctors, you have to hold their hand and whatever. But the point is that <laughs> bone marrow is in general, quite simple. If you have an orthopedic surgeon, especially who's interested, they're capable of doing this. They do it on a daily basis. So there's no, no problem. Now saying that I can say that now bone marrow is great up until you're about 50. And now if you're, uh, if you're uh, like most people, a couch potato at 50 and you're getting overweight and you're not exercising, then your bone marrow is not going to be very good uh, because bone marrow is uh, made stronger by activity. And so the more you walk, the more you run, the more you put pressure on, on the long bones uh, with gravity that stimulates the internal aspects of the bone marrow and causes the bone marrow stem cells to grow and proliferate and become stronger and healthier. So you wind up living longer because of the fact that you're exercising your long bones and stimulating your stem cells to grow. Now, after, now, if you also have had, if you have diabetes or some other chronic medical problems, that's a, another negative causing stress on the cells and whatnot. So that prevents the cells from working as well. So what you have to do is when the, and the older person comes along, we have to think about all these things and we may have to manipulate their system. So there's a thing called nupogen, granulocyte monocyte colony stimulating factor. We can give it as a shot. They use it in cancer for stimulating the bone marrow and releasing stem cells into the blood. And then they take the blood and take, isolate the stem cells, put them in a refrigerator freezer and then treat with chemo and radiation and then give the back the, the patient their own bone marrow stem cells. And that works good. But uh, in, in, in general, uh, the older you get, the more problems you have, the more you have to have a doctor who has been experienced in all of these things and knows how to uh, make sure we can clean up the system as best we can, stimulate the bone marrow as best we can. And then we have to wait for about two weeks after the nupogen, and then we can do the bone marrow. When we do the bone marrow after that, we'll get anywhere from five to 10 times more stem cells from the bone than we do otherwise. So it's, it's for the older person, it's about the only way to really do a good uh, auto transplant to, uh, 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 so autologous transplant, whereas uh, right. the allogenic that you're talking about where it's somebody else's bone marrow becomes very complicated because again, 
I don't know how many of those, I forget how many of those, like 30, 40 different, uh, at least antigens that uh, you really should match for. Uh, and yeah. if you can get an identical match, if you have a twin, that's the only time it really works well. And so if you have a twin brother, or twin sister, and you happen to get some cancer and you need somebody else's bone marrow, then you can get it from your, your sibling. But mm -hmm. other than that, it's, it's a difficult yeah. thing. And you wind up having to take medicines for the rest of your life to suppress the immunological reactions that you're having yeah. to this blood. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So this autologous, um, you know, um, stem cell therapy that you're talking about, you take your own bone marrow and you inject it into the bloodstream via IV drip. And does this have any risk factors like um, a cancer? <sighs> Can it cause? Any no, risk? no, nothing. I have not seen one problem with, I mean, I've done thousands of these and I haven't seen anybody <clears throat> have problems. Uh, I had one patient once uh, who uh, I, in the early days, I did a, I put a needle into the tibia and she was an old lady and she went home and didn't listen to what I had to say. And so the next day she took a bath and soaked it. And with that, she got an infection in that area because obviously if you have an open wound uh, and at that time we were using the Jim Sheedy, which is a number 11, big, a big needle. And so uh, there's a pretty big size hole there. And so she got it infected, but that's only one out of thousands. And that was stupidity on her part. Yeah. So you have you have stem cells that are in your bloodstream and they could like end up anywhere in your body. Right. And sure. um, how do we target? Let's say you want to um, target a specific region that you're trying to heal or to kind of repair. Um, how do you make sure that the stem cells get taken up in that particular part of the body? That's a good question. Now, there's a number of techniques you can use. Number one, uh, if it's painting you, it's swollen, it's red. Generally, you don't need to do anything. It's already saying, I need stem cells. So, but it, let's just say it's not. Uh, so what do you, what can you do? Well, uh, there's a thing called shock wave therapy, which is like a, a fancy ultrasound that goes pop, 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 and it, and it kind of throws a, a, a beam of ultrasound into that area, which causes some slight damage. And that slight damage is enough to attract the stem cells. So that's one way. And then there's platelet-rich plasma, where you take the the blood, spin it down, get the platelets out, which are coagulation factors, and they have all these growth factors, and you put them into that area by injection, and those growth factors will then attract the other the stem cells to it, uh, and uh, so that's another method. So those are, are two, but you can do other things too. Anything that, you know, you can actually, hey, if you're out there in the woods uh, and you have no other tool, you can take a, a rubber mallet and start whacking the guy, <laughs> which is... <laughs> It sounds horrible, but but you, you need some kind of trauma to the tissue for the stem cells to say, oh, it's trauma, I'll fix it. If you have no trauma, the stem cells roll around in your body and the patient says, well, I didn't feel a damn thing. I didn't get any better. Well, uh, that's because whatever it was that they're having troubles with was not uh, did not have any current injury. And so when the cells go flowing around, they don't have anything that says, come here and fix it. And if you don't have that, then you don't get any results. So you need something to tell the body and tell the stem cells where to go and what to do. Right, right. So there has to be some damage, some kind of a trauma yeah, in that part. Right, right. It doesn't have to be much, but it has to be enough for the stem cells to get there and, and settle in there. Now, mm -hmm. saying all that, there's another factor, and that is if you have a chronic infection and you don't know about it, the white blood cells will attach to those areas. Think about it. I mean, every time you have any injury, what is what happens? You get inflammation. Inflammation is caused by white blood cells, neutrophils, monocytes, lymphocytes, etc. They all go clumping right in there. And if they're there already and you throw stem cells in, the stem cells just say, well, there's nothing there because these other white blood cells have already covered up the area and settled in there and they're doing their thing. And so that can oftentimes stop that. Now, that's an, if it's an infection. Now, it, you know, and I, it's, it's crazy, but if you just have inflammation and not an infection, it oftentimes is even better. So that the infection itself is what contributes to this whole process because those, those bugs, those microbes, those bacteria attract the white blood cells and you have that combination, that's enough to stop the stem cells. But if you don't have the infection and you just have inflammation, like you hit it with a, with a you know, the rubber mallet, you haven't got infection, you just got injured. If that happens, then the stem cells know where to go and there's no interference and you get great results. Just to recap that, you have an inflammation 
and when you have an inflammation, you still have like, you know, uh, all the inflammatory mediators, cytokines and white blood cells, right? Those are still going to be uh, within that, that area in the endothelial, you know, um, walls. Um, is this not gonna, going to affect the stem cells being taken in? As a matter of fact, uh, you don't have the infection. If there's no microbes and you just have inflammation, it opens up the tissues. And so the stem cells can get in and, and fix things. So that's one thing. Now you can also manipulate the system. I've come up with, I use sometimes a thing called chelation. And chelation therapy is where you uh, use um, uh, a, a thing called ethylene, diamine, tetracetic acid, which is basically four vinegar molecules stuck together. And you put that into the blood and it grabs hold of the calcium and takes the calcium out of the gap junctions of the endothelium. So it opens up the tissue so that when you put the stem cells in, they can go throughout your whole body and infiltrate muscles, brain, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, a trick that I'm the only one in the world that's doing as far as I know. Uh, but it's, it's quite helpful for, you know, like people want to come in, they want anti-aging. Well, they have nothing wrong with them other than they're 80 years old and you check them over and there's, you know, they got, they really are just 80 years old. So what are you going to do with those? Well, you have to open up everything as much as you can throw in as much stuff. And then, then with all of that, you get some, some pretty good youngering effects, if you will. So tell me more about the therapeutic aspects, like what are other than you talk about anti-aging, other than anti-aging, what are the some of the, you know, areas where this can be beneficial? Like, could I treat, uh, could I treat like chronic um, arthritis or could I, could I treat like you talk about stroke? So give, could you please give me? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, number, number, number one. Uh, osteoarthritis, degenerative joint disease is uh, an epidemic. Uh, in this country, in the United States, we have about 32 million people who have it. And uh, out of those, uh, most of them have some restriction of movement and, and chronic pain. And if it's uh, in one joint, let's say your left knee, uh, and it's uh, every time you use that left knee, it hurts like hell. Uh, and it may swell up a little bit. Uh, if you put one vial of umbilical cord stem cells into that knee, uh, within, usually within three to five days, uh, the pain starts to diminish and within one to two weeks there's virtually no more pain and you may go without pain for three or four years uh, and instead of having to take pain pills and suffer day and night for three or four years i think it's not a bad investment uh, i think it's a great investment i know i've had it I've, I've had a number of problems with my joints like everybody else at my age and uh, so uh, whenever i have that i think time for a vial of stem cells. I started, my first case was, was me uh, because, you know, when you're starting, uh, it's like, uh, what are you going to do? You have to practice on somebody. So back in 2000, I had such bad osteoarthritis in my hips that I could not even drive. I got in the car and I, my, my bottom would hurt so bad. I said, oh, damn, I can't lift. I can't do this. So I'd had, I, I got all these pillows. I was sitting on pillows. I, my head was hitting the roof of the car. And after five minutes of even that, I couldn't handle it. So I finally said, well, what the hell? I'll just try one vial. Now, this is crazy. I said, let me just try one vial of stem cells. They were very expensive at the time. And so I said, so I gave myself a vial of that. I swear to God, within three weeks and no more pain. I haven't had any more pain since 20 years now. What are you going to do? I mean, how can you, you know, it's like craziness. And, and so when you hear stories like that, it's hard to believe that it's true because, you know, one vial is generally not, would be uh, an acceptable therapy for osteoarthritis. Generally, you want to put one vial into each joint. And with that, you get, you know, some really good, really good results. Now you can actually see through an MRI or CAT scan, the tissue regrowing, it takes three or four months to do. Now you can also, you know, if you're going to do that, you want to try to protect your joint. Uh, from trauma as, as, as such too. You don't want to say, well, I put my stem cells in there and now I can go jogging tomorrow. Uh, you don't do that. You have to wait for three or four months and, and, and favor that. And, you know, maybe even use crutches to keep the weight off so that, because you need uh, to keep the joint separated and you don't want to put pressure on that growing tissue because the tissue is growing. And if you squish it constantly, then you're kind of ruining the effect. You can't make new cartilage in there if you keep running on it and all that, but give it a few months, a couple, three months, uh, you can go back to running and doing things. I have one guy, he's now, I don't know, he's eight years out, still running. 
so, uh, you know, he was scheduled for a, a knee, knee replacement. I gave him one vial of stem cells and here he is. He, he, once in a while he calls or writes and says, Hey, guess what? I just did this marathon. <laughs> it's okay. So, so you see some, some miraculous things, but you know, another, you know, once in a while you have a failure, but yeah, I would say our success rate for, for joints is about 90%, which is damn good. And so, so that's the joints. Now we have autoimmune conditions like you're mentioning, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, things like that. In general, the stem cells are very effective for those. Um, you get some, let's see, what else? Uh, stroke, uh, uh, we have a great program for stroke. Uh, uh, in, and so uh, many people who have stroke now uh, will just call my office and, and become patients that way. Uh, because I can send them stem cells and it's a simple thing. You open up the, the, your liquid nitrogen, pull it out or, or liquid or dry ice, pull it out, let it thaw, suck up to the stuff and, and inject it into the belly. It's just pick up a piece of tissue and stick it in. It's simple. Anybody can do it. And so if you do that, that's, that's helpful. But then in addition to that, then I have them do uh, uh, some growth factors. And in Germany, they're, they're, this is now, I think, illegal is legal and that's called uh, cerebrolysine. And cerebrolysine is an extract of embryonic pig brain. And it really helps the, uh, the, the body repair the brain, uh, repair the stroke. If you have stem cells, you have stem cells and cerebrolysine together, that's a hell of a combination. You, you, know, you see results, you, know, you can have a person who's had a stroke for five years and there's gotten no better whatsoever. He's tried everything, nothing's healthy. You put him on this and within two to three weeks, he's getting better and better and better, that kind of thing. So the more you do of these kind of growth factors and stem cells in these chronic stroke patients, the better. Now, if you have an acute stroke, that's a whole different thing. Uh, so if, and, and so if you have plenty of money and you have access to lots of stem cells, then you want to give stem cells immediately and then every day. Uh, but in general, most people don't have unlimited money and, and whatnot. So uh, you have to see, figure out what's the best time that say you're going to give one vial of stem cells. You'd want to give it on day three. 72 hours after the stroke. That's when the tissue is most wide open, most accepting of the stem cells. So that's the, your timing there. But in general, like I say, if you can give more stem cells, you get better results too. Now, uh, and then of course, if it's an acute stroke, uh, acute stroke is caused, uh, it causes swelling of the brain. And if you have swelling of the brain, then that causes further damage. So you want to stop the swelling of the brain. So you can't do that with stem cells, but you can do that with hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and if you have studied hyperbaric oxygen, and even now today, you go to uh, Google and put in hyperbaric oxygen and stroke, you'll say, it'll tell you that, yeah, it's somewhat helpful, but Da, 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 it's not that great. Da, 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 da. And you look at it and say, well, wait a second. How often was it done? So you have an acute stroke and they do one hyperbaric oxygen treatment a day for 10 days or two weeks. And then they say, well, so we, and then they have a placebo. And so it didn't get much result. However, if you do it every four hours in that first 24 hours, that's when you get results. And the reason is because the brain swells up after an injury within three and a half hours. So it swells up and if you do hyperbaric, it'll decrease the swelling. And then after you finish, it'll start to swell again. And it does that all for that first 24 hours. So if you treat every four hours during that first 24 hours, you can stop and reverse most all the stroke that happens. Now, unfortunately, the doctors that are doing this research have not got one brain cell that, as far as they're concerned. I think they've all had strokes too, because it, it, they have not even sat down with a patient and treated them themselves. They say here to, to the nurse or to their hyperbaric technician and said, go do a treatment. And instead of standing there watching their patient, and if they watch their patient after they do the hyperbaric, the person gets better. And their the stroke paralysis goes away. And then it comes back within that three and a half hours or so. And so then you put them in hyperbaric and again, you have it. So, so using hyperbaric oxygen in that acute situation is great, but unfortunately most doctors, most clinics, most hospitals don't do that because of whatever reason. And so, uh, but it, it is quite effective. So other than that, what else is it? Uh, traumatic brain injury, great. Uh, and that just simple hyperbaric oxygen or stem cells, either one works quite well. Um, the Russians, uh, uh, you know, over at EM cell, which is the embryonic stem cell in the Ukraine. Uh, they've been at it now for 30, they've been at it longer than me. Uh, and so they've been doing it like 25, 30 years now. 
And they have claimed that traumatic brain injury uh, is so treatable that they can't even publish results because they're so good. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, if that's the case, then, and then that would make sense that, uh, that you would want to use like the cerebral lacing and, and stem cells for those traumatic brain injuries if you don't have access to hyperbaric. If you have access to hyperbaric, it's great because hyperbaric oxygen helps repair that brain damage from a traumatic brain injury as well. Now, is saying all of that, uh, uh, both uh, traumatic brain injury and stroke have inflammation as part of their process. And, and this inflammation causes the body to react and start developing an autoimmune problem to that damaged tissue in the brain. And so both stem cells and hyperbaric oxygen helps dampen this autoimmune kind of problem too that, that most doctors have never even heard of. Uh, but uh, so anyway, so there's that. Now, uh, what else is there to talk about? There's, uh, well, Hi. cerebral palsy, autism, all these children things, muscular dystrophy even. I've even seen, now talking about muscular dystrophy, uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is interesting. Uh, I haven't treated that many, but the ones that I've treated, I always test for heavy metals. And I found that every one of the ones that I had, had lead poisoning. And, and you say, well, okay. And I, you treat them for lead poisoning and they actually got better. <laughs> you didn't have to give them stem cells because of the fact that lead interferes with the calcium ATPase and allows calcium to go into the cell and cause damage to the cells, the muscle cells and all that. So if you remove the lead, that stops that whole process and, and it'll help keep the uh, muscles intact. Anyway, sorry, sidebar. Right. Right, that's, that's really fascinating. What I have in mind is also your experience with uh, treating like allergic diseases, like hyper allergic reactions and asthma and uh, lung conditions. Uh, I haven't seen that much uh, as far as those are concerned. Now, um, there's a treatment that's uh, maybe better, uh, simpler, cheaper, and that's uh, intermittent hypoxia. And intermittent hypoxia or ischemic preconditioning, uh, high altitude training uh, seems to work pretty well. Uh, it's cheap, uh, cheap, cheap compared to everything else. Uh, you, you know, you can buy the machine for about five thousand dollars, and you can just keep it at home and treat yourself whenever. I think it's one of the best treatments that there is for aging as well, because it increases your capillary density, which means that you're much more. Uh, uh, your, your body is more efficient at metabolizing your food and converting it into energy and into tissue. And so anything you can do to have more blood vessels in your muscles and in your tissues, you're going to live longer and be healthier. Uh, and so as we get older and older, our growth factors start to diminish. And if we don't have enough growth factors, we can't make and repair our blood vessels. And if we can't repair our blood vessels, we get heart attacks and strokes and all these other things that, are, uh, that we get uh, as we get older. And so that machine is, uh, uh, there's a couple of three different companies that make it, go to altitude, uh, hypoxico, et cetera. Uh, and so, uh, like I say, and you can go to eBay, sometimes you can buy them on eBay. Even. And so that's a, that's a good therapy that, uh, that I've seen like asthma disappear. I've seen allergies like bronchitis that has been going on forever disappear. Uh, angina, heart disease uh, goes away. Uh, and then talking about that reminds me of external counterpulsation, which is an, a cardiac uh, treatment that generally is for angina. But again, it, it's sort of the same thing. It, by, uh, by using blood pressure cuffs, it causes your blood to go from your legs back into your heart, into the coronary arteries, causes the coronary arteries to dilate, and uh, it stimulates uh, growth factors. And so you get more blood vessels in your heart, which makes you more, more uh, able to handle a lack of oxygen, and so your angina disappears because you don't have the and don't have that ischemia, lack of oxygen in those situations. So I have all of these different techniques in my office, and so I have a you know compared to anybody else, uh, I've got one of the most well-equipped offices, uh, and I can go on. I got all kinds of more t little things. I got all kinds of tricks. I got the shock. I got the ECP. I got the hyperbaric. I got the stem cells. I got the PRP. I got the growth factor. I got the chelation. I got the da 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 da. da. Uh, so, uh, right. so people come because they hear that I've got all these tricks and I've and actually been around long enough to know what to do with them. 
Right, right. That's absolutely fascinating. You know, I'm the um, asthma and allergy question I ask because of selfish reasons. I myself have quite a bit of asthma and allergy. And every time like the pollen, the seasonal uh, allergy season starts, I kind of start. Well, well, well if you're ready for something, something really wild, uh, the Indians, uh, uh, you know, East India, uh, have uh, been working with urine for many years. They have uh, they have worshipped the cows and the urine that the cows pee, and they take that urine from the cows and they pour it all over people and whatnot. And it turns out when you take the person like yourself who has an allergy to say the pollens. Today you have you go outside and the pollens are everywhere. And you're sneezing and hacking. What you do is then you come in and the next time you pee, collect your urine sterilely, and then you take that urine and spin it down at uh, like 3000 RPM for 12 minutes. And then you take the, not the bottom part, but you take the supernatant, which is now free of particulates and it has just small molecular weight antigens. And so your antigens that you have inhaled have been processed by your body and now are expelled into the urine and they have been modified slightly by this process of proteolysis that your body puts them through. Now, when you take those and, and put them into a syringe, 10 ml syringe, put a 0.22 micron filter on it and give yourself a shot once a week. In 12 shots, 60% of people like you will have been cured. All right. I'm gonna do that biohack on myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's simple, safe, and yet, you know, the allergists go crazy because they don't want to hear about it because it's, it would take, take away all their business because they're making thousands of dollars giving you shots every week of the same kind of material, but they have to process it. And they can, so, and then you don't know what you're doing. So you have to trust them to give you what is right. And in this situation, you don't have to trust anybody. You just have to make sure that you did it correctly, like I just described. And, and that's it. So it's, it's a simple technique. There's all kinds of books on it too. Uh, what I, I, is this technique called, by the way? How, how do you, I? You, urine therapy. Urine, urine therapy. Urine therapy. That's, that's, that's a fancy name. <laughs> yeah. And, and so now, of course, they, some, you know, some would call it drinking the urine. That's one way. Uh, and if you do that, you can also do it that way, I think. No, uh, thank if, you. <laughs> if, if, yeah, let me tell you quick about how to do it, though, if you were, decide to do it. Some people don't want shots. So no, if, you, if you have these allergy problems, you can take your urine, like after you've been exposed to whatever it is that you're allergic to, take that, spin it down. Now you've got the supernatant. Now you take cream, cream, cow's cream. And then that's pure cream. And you take that cream and mix it like one to one with your urine and then beat the bejesus out of it, you know, with a, you know, in some kind of a mixing kind of device. So what you're trying to do is form an emulsion, which, mm -hmm becomes basically there are exosomes in cream and the exosomes then will pick up the antigens and then you swallow them and those exosomes will be transported from your from your GI tract into your blood and you now have like a treatment for allergies without any shots. Right. Crazy, right. huh? Absolutely. I am going to give that one a thought. <laughs> 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 Thank you. It's it's absolutely fascinating. You know, all well, the different then you can always go back to standard old doctor stuff, and that is a shot of steroids. You know, like like uh, Salumedrol. If you gave yourself, uh, had your doctor give you, you know, say ten milligrams, twenty milligrams of Salumedrol, sometimes that'll get put you into remission for a year or two. And so it's for for one simple shot of steroid. Uh, you know, if you have success, that's great because, like I said, it can last a year or two. And so, one shot a year, you know, going to the doctor and all of your allergies go away, it's not a bad idea. So, that's another thing cheap, simple, and the doctor is more than happy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, all these, um, it's, it's fascinating to hear you say all that because traditionally, and not a lot of doctors like they think that way, they would rather. Um, continuously keep giving you medication. So well, they, don't, um, they don't know anything else. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah, it's interesting how, how, you know, alternative practices are not 
always um, combined into the regular doctor's office. But I, I'm very, you know, um, you know, I find it really fascinating how some of these therapies really work well. And I would wish that here, I want to ask you at this point, you know, seeing, <clears throat> especially when we talk about stem cells, do you see, uh, because when it comes to stem cells, a lot of different doctors have different experiences. Um, you know, like yourself, you have done it for so many years. And also you have, you know, research um, coming out. What do you see? How is this going to change in the future? Are we going to see like standardized guidelines? Are we going to see like really, um, you know, this more and more being incorporated into um, like clinical practice as we know it? Well, I think so. We, you know, I think we're seeing the orthopedic surgeons uh, getting into it because they're doing things with bones and bone marrows all the time. And so that's become within the last, I would say three years, uh, using the person's own bone marrow for helping heal uh, different uh, surgical operations has become much more common. Uh, so I think that's one area. The uh, other doctors, the general practitioners and naturopaths, et cetera, they're tending to do just these simple uh, injections that uh, these companies that don't know what they're doing much <laughs> are selling to them. Uh, so uh, that, that part is going to go away, I think, because the FDA uh, is not too happy about having general practitioners who don't know what they're doing, uh, buying stem cells and then just giving them without checking them and having to deal with allergic reactions and all that kind of thing. And, and so there's been some, you know, a few complications, uh, at least uh, some people down in Florida, three people went blind from uh, fat kind of stem cells and things like that. So, so the FDA would like to probably police this more and they've been saying that they are, but with this COVID, uh, the FDA has kind of been uh, too busy uh, dealing with people dying of COVID uh, and trying to figure out what to do with all that because, uh, you know, there's people like me who are trying to come up with cures for the COVID. And so, uh, you know, when we have a few bucks, we try to put it together toward some new product. And now the FDA has to deal with that, try to figure out is it good or not and all that. So, so the FDA is, I think, pretty busy and they don't get that much money and whatnot. So uh, right now, it may very well be that uh, the stem cells continue to be used by all these doctors. I don't know. Uh, all I know is that I, I'm using, you know, and exosomes are becoming more and more uh, uh, available too. Uh, and those are simpler and cheaper, not simpler. Uh, they're simpler and, and not maybe the, they're not as cheap or they're just as cheap and just as expensive, uh, but uh, they have less allergic reactions. You have uh, very few of those reactions. And so I think, that the, the, the market is going toward exosomes, which are tiny, small little uh, particles that are anywhere from 30 to 100 nanometers, so very tiny. And they're full of things like RNA and DNA and whatnot that help uh, uh, signal to the rest of the body uh, what to do and how to do it. And so those exosomes are becoming more and more popular because when you give an injection of that, in general, you don't have allergic reactions, whereas the stem cells that they're buying do have allergic reactions. And so uh, the doctors are not that stupid. They say, well, wait a second, I get the same results with the exosomes, same money, and I don't have the allergic reaction. I'll, I'll choose the exosomes. So I think that's uh, right now where the market's going is more exosomes and stem cells for these average doctors. Me, uh, I don't have reaction because I grow my own and, and it's done in a safe way and you know thoroughly tested and all that. So out of all the, I've done over 200,000 shots of, of uh, stem cells and I've had only five reactions and they were mild reactions to the preservative, that's DMSO. And so a little DMSO can cause some some people a little bit of allergic and a little rash and you know, discomfort, that kind of thing, but in general, nothing serious. And so uh, uh, the technique that I've got is very safe, simple, and very effective. Whereas these other guys who are buying stem cells that are you know, these ground up cord cells and all that, they have got uh, foreign tissues and you get graft versus host reactions, which can be serious. And these graft versus host reactions can, can, can come on three months after. And so that, you know, anybody that's been doing, uh, you know, transplants uh, uh, is aware that uh, when you have a graft versus host, it may not be, it may be today uh, or it could be a month or two months or three months. 
And here you are, you think you're fine and doing well and that maybe the stem cell didn't work at all, but here you get sick, you know, and you get gastritis and colitis and diarrhea and allergies or whatever. And that's what it's all about. So um, better to not have those reactions uh, maybe better to use exosomes if you can get them. If the only trouble with exosomes is again, the, the guys that are making them, you have to, you know, program those exosomes to do something special. So if you could have you, arthritis, you have to use those kind of cells. Go ahead. Could you please, um, could you please explain how exactly the exosomes work? Like, what is it for for non-medical folk? Like, what is an exosome therapy? Well, uh, they're little tiny like blisters that pop off of the stem cells. And so that they have uh, some of the growth factors, some of the RNA. RNA is like uh, with, with COVID, it's RNA. And uh, so they're, they're using RNA to stimulate your own body to make these things and, and they can last for a long time. And so by putting RNA into your system that tells your body to say, shut down the allergy, uh, then, uh, you know, cross your fingers and uh, maybe actually uh, those exosomes will help uh, stop your body from reacting to these uh, uh, antigens that you're being exposed to, that you're reacting to. So uh, exosomes are generally non-allergenic. They don't cause allergies, uh, number one. Number two, they, do can, they can be made from uh, stem cells. And with that, they have uh, the same properties that the stem cells have. And then uh, third is that uh, it appears that uh, uh, they can have a long lasting effect uh, and uh, so I, I've been kind of uh, shy about using them because, uh, again, uh, you know, like everything new, it takes time before uh, we doctors can figure out what to do with this new product. And, and so in general, now it seems to be that it's, uh, that can give some lasting results. Now, saying all of that, you can also have companies that make these exosomes and claim all kinds of things and they don't work at all. And so there is a, there is a, a problem with uh, some of the companies because uh, the people that are doing it don't really know what they're doing. Uh, they don't have the equipment to do it. They don't have the right stem cells to do it. They haven't got the technical knowledge to do it. And so when you have all this together, it can be a kind of a buyer beware. And that's been what it's been now for the last 20 years is buyer beware as far as stem cells are concerned. And now we have the same kind of thing with exosomes. Uh, you know, three years ago, I tried exosomes and I spent uh, uh, all the patient's money, about $10,000 a person. And this was treating ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And I would give stem cells and the exosomes, you would think that would do something. And out of three cases, absolutely nothing. And so I said, hmm, I don't know if I wanna keep spending people's money and we don't get any results. So I've been kind of reluctant to get back into the exosomes, but I'm, I'm seeing now that the technology is becoming better and better. So I might start getting, I've been, I can grow it myself. So I, I might uh, just do that too. So uh, that way I control it. Whereas if I'm buying it from somebody else, I, they, they lie to me, you know, they'll tell me all kinds of BS. Oh yeah, these are great cells, da, 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 da. you know, they're used car salesmen and they'll tell you anything, but they don't know what they're talking about. You say, what kind of stem cells are you selling? Uh, what do you mean? What kind of stem cells? Uh, yeah, you know, stem cells are, you know, there are different kinds. There's, there are things called like antigens on their, on their surface. They're like CD34, positive. What's, what's that? Right. <laughs> they, they don't know any of it. You know, I say, how can you come in here and try to sell me something you have no clue about what the hell you're talking about? Get out of here. I throw their, out they go. <laughs> Get out of here. You crazy. Right, right. That is funny. So you know, um, uh, <clears throat> I could I could ask I could keep asking you questions. You know, however, for the interest of time, I don't want to keep you longer than we scheduled. Any parting advice you want to give, like in general, to you know, to the viewers watching this, anything? Well, people always call up and say, "What about such and such?" Well, don't call me. Go to Google and put in stem cells and your condition, and then read, you know? Don't think that I'm gonna spend my time just because I happen to be a doctor who's knowledgeable and I'm gonna stop what I'm doing, and I'm a busy fellow, and I'm gonna stop what I'm doing, and you asking me about uh, Susagamushi fever, and I'm going, huh? 
I have to look it up on Google. Why don't you look it up on Google? You know, I mean, th these are strange conditions people have sometimes. And, and all they have to do is, you know, say if, they, if they're not smart enough to do it, then ask somebody that is. Ask a nurse or some friend of theirs that is smart to, to look it up on Google to tell them. Because why call me? I have to stop what I'm doing. It takes me time to look it up. And for that, I get nothing out of it. And, and so I, I'm not too happy about doing it. And yet you don't know what I'm talking about because I rattle off about this and that. So you still don't know after I tell you yes or no, or I say maybe. And when I say maybe, then you're in real trouble because it's a maybe. Like if you have an infection, if you don't have an infection, if you have iron deficiency or not iron deficiency, if you have thyroid or, or not thyroid, and it goes on and on. All the different factors that go into making a person healthy, all of those things need to be, you know, as close to perfect as you can. And then the injury has to be as clean as it can be. And the stem cells have to be as clean as it can be. And you have to do everything right. You can't be smoking. You can't be drinking. You can't be, uh, you know, carousing. Uh, you can't be under lots of stress, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all these many factors that go into uh, a successful uh, stem cell treatment. And so the more you know about all of it, the better off you're going to be and the more chance yeah. you're going to have of having a, a successful outcome. So get informed before you call Dr. Steenblock, like self-education before you make that call. Right, right. Well, or any other doctor. I mean, you know, you should learn as much as you can about whatever problems right. you have. I've right. been campaigning for, for artificial intelligence software so that anybody and everybody can put in their subject, their, all their symptoms and have the computer come out and say, oh, well, it could be all of these things here. Do this, 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 and this first. That would solve a lot of, that would solve about half of our costs in this country. Right. That, you're talking about $400 billion we could save if we had a good artificial intelligence system set up so that just the average Joe could put in his symptoms and it would come back and say, well, you need, this looks like it could be this and this and this, you should do this and this and this. And that would solve the problem with having to go to the doctor and try to explain to the doctor all these things. And then he has to say, oh, or he or she said, oh, well, what am I gonna do? <laughs> and he has to look it up, but he doesn't look it up. How many doctors have you gone to that have a computer <coughs> sitting in their office and other than doing their electronic records? They'll sit there, what's your name? What's your birthday? Da -da. When did the symptoms start? All that, that's electronic records. It has nothing to do with your health. It has to do with getting the medical records so that they get paid. That's all they care about. Yeah. But, but you say, well, how about, how about rheumatoid arthritis and stem cells? They go, uh, I don't know. And then move on because they don't want to spend time to look it up and tell you that, yeah, and they don't have stem cells that they know or can trust either. So you wind up with a doctor and I have not seen one doctor not one in all these years that has their own computer that they look up on PubMed or Google, anything about the case that they're dealing with right today. Not one. And that's been now, I, I got my first first uh, PubMed, you know, National Library of Medicine uh, subscription in 1986. I was one of the first in the world to have it. I had to pay $3,600 per year for that. Oh. And I did. So that was 1986, 87. And I did it then. And then when Gore came out in what, 98 and made it free, I said, thank God I don't have to pay $3,000 a year anymore. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so that was great. Thank, thank you, Al Gore. So, right. so right. but you know, but the doctors before or after still don't use it, even though it's free now. Right. So, you, you know, you, you know, you can use it. Anybody can use it. So why not use PubMed wherever you are in the world, go to PubMed and, and Google, Google PubMed. There's another one called freefullpdf.com. Freefullpdf.com gives you a lot of articles for free that otherwise you have to pay for. So you can look mm -hmm. them up on PubMed and it says you got to pay $30 or $50 don't believe it. Go over to freefullpdf.com. You'll get it for free most of, most of the time. Yeah, we'll we'll put the links in the descriptions. So if you if uh, people want to learn more about what you're doing, you know the work that you do, where can they find you? Well, strokedoctor.com. That's a good place. You know, get right. there. There's lots of papers now. Also, YouTube. If you go to YouTube, if you have a condition, a stroke, whatever, uh, cerebral palsy, just put in cerebral palsy steam block. 
on YouTube and you should come up with somebody who's talking about what they did and how they did it and all the results and all that. So that would be good. I've got we'll a lot put of, all the links in the descriptions yeah, below. Got lots of YouTube videos. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Steenblock. Okay. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much too. Have a good day. Thank you.